process. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves and just say a few words about uh, what they you know, what they want to talk about today, and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of move into some of the to the to the session full. So, Mitch. Well, this is what I want to talk about, and then this is what I will talk about because <laughs> I was asked. So I'm here primarily to provide the legal perspective for the issues that we have in international cyber security. Um, my perspective comes from a couple of angles. Uh, before I became a judge, I was an assistant U.S. attorney here in San Diego. I was the cybercrime coordinator for the office, and I did have the uh, um, unique experience of working with the FBI to, uh, on international criminal cases, both of hacking as well as financial crimes uh, that occurred by use of the internet from overseas. And uh, that, that experience uh, led me to believe that we're, to we're, we're in the toilet. When it comes to, uh, <laughs> when it, when it comes to, to having to investigate for criminal purposes, uh, cyber incidents, with the, the idea that we can do something quickly, rationally, with an effect that makes a difference um, in some sort of timely manner is, is very unusual in the international arena um, for a whole host of reasons, uh, primarily are, are the silly thing called sovereignty. Um, you know, the notion that, uh, that you know, every country has a, it protects its citizens to a certain extent, criminal and otherwise, and the, the notion of being able to operate in someone else's sovereign space. Well, we have it right here in the United States. I mean, th there are some difficulties uh, on some Native American lands in terms of uh, our, the ability of some states uh, to investigate crimes that occur on reservations. Um, now, you just to take that problem and expand it into the international arena, and you see what we're dealing with, particularly where countries have, some countries have very different views about what may be criminal conduct, what may not. Uh, adding to that today, you know, at, the last time I did this was two years ago, and we were talking about almost theoretically at that time, you know, how we can figure out whether or not it's a person. Well, put aside the problems of attribution, whether we can decide whether it is an actual person uh, just acting either in a group or on their own to commit these these offenses, whether it's whether it's hacking for damage, hacking for profit, or uh, stealing information for fun, for posting, for profit, um, versus whether it is actually a nation state that is operating. And of course, now that problem, which we talked about two years ago in more of the theoretical sense, mostly, <laughs> uh, has become much more of a reality and much more public than it was several years ago. And that creates issues that the legal system simply can't handle. Um, once you start dealing with nation states, or even thinking that a, another nation is behind an activity, you're gone from the arena of law and investigation and prosecution. You're now into an entirely different area um, of what may be war or what may be terrorism. Um, and these, uh, so when we talk about, you know, whenever I do these conferences with like real people, not you, the uh, the, the, the thing that, well, it's true, because you folks kind of in, are, are in this world. The issue that is most of concern to normal people uh, is identity theft, what we call identity theft. Um, identity theft is a name. It, we, we gave a nice, you know, cool name to something that is really pretty mundane, which is mostly stealing credit card numbers, um, just stealing debit card numbers, and then, you know, using them for profit. Um, and the next step, of course, being taking, creating the whole identity of the person and getting credit to do it. And that's what real people are concerned about. Uh, but of course, now we have, we, we see that even something as mundane as that in the traditional criminal legal world has moved from within one country to others and has made it unbelievably difficult, unbelievably difficult to try and get a handle on who is doing it, uh, whether they're alone, whether they're in a group, or whether they're doing it to raise money for their government. Um, whether they're sponsored by their government. And of course, once we cross that area, uh, we just have barriers um, that are set up to prevent us from doing so, as they would have barriers and do have barriers trying to investigate crime, what their perception of crime is, in our country. Um, we always, we, we forget sometimes, we want to, as Americans, we tend to want these things to be one-way streets. 
Um, we think because we're always acting in the right, and everybody should completely understand that. So that you know, we protect our citizens' rights. You don't. So you, we need you to give us your stuff. And of course, when we get the requests in from other countries, and we look at their system as just not quite as perfect as ours, um, we, we, we say, well, no, we can't. We have to protect our people. We can't let you see this stuff. And we get all, we get all excited about it because, wait a minute, you know, they can't have this. They're France. We hate the French, for example. Um, <laughs> That's on so, camera, don't worry. <laughs> no, 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 it's OK. Because I'm sitting here with a Brit. I figured I'd say, hey, we hate the French. I, I thought maybe he'd appreciate it <laughs> and, and may want to chime in to, and, and, yeah, and explain to us exactly why. Uh, that's okay. I mean, there's, there's only one person that the Frenchman hates more than the Brit, and that's another French person. So. <laughs> <laughs> only, only because they have good taste. <laughs> I've been to France. I like the French. They haven't been completely uncooperative. But it's just, it's just the notion that, if you, just as, as an example, uh, Germany is actually a, a good example of the problem. In Germany, there are, there are crimes. If you, um, anything involving the Nazi era, uh, written work, uh, anything that resembles a fascist statement is illegal in Germany. And of course, uh, some of these writings are published through American ISPs and American publishers. So the Germans regularly, when I was a prosecutor, would seek American assistance in determining who published and distributed or who bought, for example, Mein Kampf, who bought it. Uh, within Germany. And of course, we look at that and go, that's ridiculous. You know, the First Amendment protects this sort of thing. Well, they don't have the First Amendment. So we sort of, we, we don't let them get the information they want to prosecute their crimes because we don't agree that what they're looking at should be a crime. And of course, it, it, and when it goes the other way around, when we want to investigate activity, financial irregularity in other countries, or even hacking crimes in other countries, um, they often say, well, it's, this isn't a crime. We don't have anything on our books to say that, that, it, that you can't do this. And as a consequence, you know, we wonder, we pull our hair out and wonder why you know, we, have, we have these issues. And when the matters get more serious, when it steps up from identity theft to true damage, um, we really get frustrated. And the law is simply, is not the answer. Uh, the answer is collaborative efforts uh, between victims, really, between victims and their conduits, whether they're, whether they're you know, who have made it possible, perhaps unintentionally, for these acts to occur. It's that level of international cooperation at the level of providers that actually makes any of this happen, if they can do so consistent with their laws. And in the two years that, that since I've done this, um, the laws haven't changed at all. There's absolutely no improvement in the state of international legal cooperation in investigating criminal internet activity. So that's what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mitch. That's an interesting, really interesting perspective. And we'll come back to a couple of those points um, in, a, in a little while. I think one of the interesting points that, you know, we, we, that Mitch has raised is the whole uh, what, what hap you know, how do you get things to change? And, and the victim collaboration is certainly one of those ways. And if you look at history, the big changes that have changed international law across the board have been serious warfare incidents. And that's a, it might be an interesting discussion to have. So I'm going to hand it on to, to Glenn now to, to give his perspective. Yeah, I'd love to say the defense has no witnesses and we'll call none, but <laughs> I've never sat next to a judge in a panel like this. But. Um, but, but following with that, how's it um, feel? Excellent, excellent. I object. Um, it's nice so, to be on this side of the bench. <laughs> these are all personal firsts for me. So, um, I know all the people are supposed to be standing. <laughs> <laughs> all, all ruse. Um, anyhow, um, at some point I should probably tell you a little bit about a little bit about my background, not for reasons of self-aggrandizement, although it may go in the other direction, but rather so you can calibrate my comments. So why don't I do that? Um, I think the, the, the fulcrum of my career and the thing that brings me to this meeting is that in 1989, a few, actually the evening the Berlin Wall fell, uh, a friend of mine suggested maybe I should go to Eastern Europe and help flip them to a decent governance and economic system. So I spent the, the entire year of 1990, starting a few weeks after the Berlin Wall fell, 
um, touring around and living in uh, Warsaw and then through the rest of the former Eastern Bloc, looking for opportunities to start companies at the intersection of international business, computer networking, and software, which were already things I'd spent about 15 years working on. Um, and because it was impossible to make a phone call from Poland to the West without a one week previous appointment, because of course Poland wanted to have a world class phone system that was guaranteed to make them proud, but of course they didn't want anyone to communicate. This was an interesting problem, so they had a non-contiguous network in Poland. What that means is the different phone districts, of which there were 18, couldn't talk to each other. The cables were always breaking. Well, in fact, they weren't breaking. They were just disconnected. So the best way to set up a lunch between two people across the street from each other was to go down to the Western Union office, or their equivalent in the Eastern Bloc, send a telegram, and have them meet you for lunch somewhere. Because you couldn't use phones inside the country because world-class communication in the Eastern Bloc meant people dare not communicate. So I started doing networking. I started doing UUCP networks, a kind of early and primitive network, to dial up to the West on a hop-by-hop on a -hop basis. And some guys who had worked for me when I was a director at, at Gould Computer Systems doing Unix research for 10 years wanted me to see if I could take this 18-country, 18 top-end 18 university cluster of more or less free email services that they were providing, which was now netting almost free, about a million dollars a year, and the tax man was showing up. They said, you know, maybe we can do something with this. Turn it off, give it away, turn it into a corporation. So I came on board um, and converted 18 different academic clubs into 18 corporations and then a multinational corporation in uh, Europe. We were the first commercial and the first multinational ISP in Europe. And for a time, we had the broadest geographic span of any enter entity in the internet. We went from Washington, D.C. to Vladivostok. And you might say, in 1991, how could we possibly do internet working in Russia? Well, we used the KGB's network which was pretty cool, because I got to go into some of their communication centers in 1993. It was a time of transition, um, and it was pretty neat work. So my work is formed by that, uh, is informed and formed by that. And the points I'd like to bring for this meeting, and this is a very important meeting, because you were at a fulcrum point, which I'll point to at the end of my, my opening notes, which is that um, uh, it, it forms up with the issue that, just like Judge Mitch said, if you think that the system elsewhere in the world is like ours, if you think they're going to be responsive, they're not. Um, I read an article 20 years ago by a great travel writer, actually, in an interview. And they said, well, you know, what, what's the one thing you observed when you traveled around the world? And he said, well, everyone thinks that if we could just communicate, we'd get along. If you mysteriously made language disappear and all of a sudden we could all speak Esperanto or Chinese or English or something, would a Tuareg warrior and a Navajo and a New York businessman and a Parisian baker and an Aztec and so on, would they all be able to get along? He said, absolutely not it would probably be worse than it is right now. Now, I don't happen to necessarily agree with that, but I think it's a really important point because we're moving into some kind of global coordination. And that brings up the question, how can we converge not just on vague agreements, but on principles? If you think that the United States is even vaguely American, you're really wrong. The fundamentals that shape American society, pioneering ethic, um, English common law, uh, lots of free resources, a cooperative society in a, in a de Tocquevillian sense, it's not that like that at all in other countries. And it presents um, the first time I'll invoke the word dilemma if you want to do anything abroad. But then you can bring up the question of what about developmental issues? We're all coming along. We're developing quickly. The world isn't, to a large extent, adopting the American system of development. And that's true. And in fact, it has a flip that is, we have a sense of, but I want to very much emphasize. And that flip is that. In 1700 or so, the average American owned 15 times more property, had 15 times more wealth than the average Chinese. Excuse me. In 1700, our, our wealth was about parity. But by 1970, you know, Americans had about 15 times the wealth of Chinese. And this is called the great divergence between the West and the East. It was partially formed by the colonial period, but also by institutions of innovation and wealth creation that did not exist in the East. But that system has now changed, and it's changed very quickly. So that since 1970, when the ratio was 15 to 1, it's now 5 to 1 between China and the United States. And according to Neil Ferguson, the great economic philosopher and historian, it's going to be 2.5 in a few years. And what that means for the United States is the two great bubbles that we've lived on for now the better part of a century and a half, especially in creation of guns, since we're the world's best creators of guns, even more than the Germans. Um, what that means is that the two great bubbles we've been on for all these years are going to decline. The first bubble is domination of the world technological system. We have, for years and years, led in technology. The Ford system for production, electronics, the sciences, all sorts of things. The second area where we've had huge dominance 
is in setting up the world economic system. GATT and all the other systems are essentially projection of the Anglo-American model of economics and society onto the rest of the world. And when China, in just a few years, probably 2017 on purchasing power parity base, but maybe within a decade on a dollar base, when China is as big as us, and they are the biggest customer, and their national policy for continuation of their business with no reliance on external standards, with the biggest single um, economics, excuse me, electronics marketplace in the world, and a country that can overnight decide they're going to manufacture 40% of the world's PCs in one city in central China and accomplish the construction of that city in under five years. Under that system, the great bubble that we live on, that is the arrogance of this meeting, no one in particular, but it's what we assume, that we're kind of doing the leading wave, that we're setting the architectures of the internet. It's not over, but it's not the same. And we don't know what it's going to be shaped like, but it's going to be different. And things will shake. Some of the things that will shake will be um, the world economic trading system based on virtuous competition, i.e. the survival of the most competent, price competitive, value competitive corporations. We'll probably move in the direction of managed trade. And the kind of pressures that we pushed on the rest of the world for our ethics and our morals and our senses of governance, like free speech, are going to be challenged. And you can say this is ephemeral, that it's not happening. But in the UN, Britain, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and under leadership by Russia and China right now are putting forth a proposal to govern the internet through a central entity, the International Telecommunications Union, and put in place probably phase number two of the world communications order, which means that you won't be able to insult a head of state anywhere on the internet. And in the past, we've been able to open doors in other countries because of our economic weight, and that is over. So that takes us to the situation of this meeting. What is the internet anyway? Well, I'm going to offer you a very abstracted view of the internet, and I think it's a good model to carry forward in our collective and individual noggins. And that model is the internet is a single point where humans meet, and also silicon entities, little processes and processors and server farms and so on and so forth. The reason why I call it a single point is having this funny little math degree from the University of Illinois. I, I ask the question, what's the distance function between any two people? What's the measure of distance between them? And on the internet, it's zero. There's no distance. You can measure it in a few microseconds or milliseconds, but short of some kind of governmental constraint, anyone on the internet can get to anybody else in about eh, 45 milliseconds. That's how fast routers are. That means we're all on one point. That means, in spite of the fact that we don't have the same common framework for governance or for law or society or life, or even just the way we look at the world, we're all sitting on the same point, and a great evolution is coming up. So that takes us now to the overall question of what's the purpose of this group and how do they work? Well, their, their goal is to make us safe while we've all met at this meeting point and we have these whoppingly different view of the world, views of the world. Well, the approach we have to take and what, having polled a fair number of people here, seems to be the approach is we're going to go and we're going to look at all the corners of the internet. We're going to take a multi-dimensional approach. We will build better antivirus software. We will build better monitoring tools on the core and in the corporation. We'll build better access controls. We'll work on protocols having to do with authentication, accounting, and administration. We will then work in the domain of law, which we must. We will get better law in our countries. We'll do more coordination with actors in other countries. We'll build one-on-one -on -one partnerships. We'll build additional treaties, and maybe we'll even, as Judge said before the, the, our discussion here, that maybe we'll even need a world government at some point. Not but, until we're invaded from another galaxy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but as someone who, I'm going to pull a little historical rank, who's done about uh, 20 years of work in internet architectures, I think it's safe for me to say that all of the work that we will do there, which will make great progress, will still leave a system which is incredibly exposing to us. In other words, being safe in the way that we want to be safe, let's say in a manner circa 1973, or actually 19, October 1969, the day before the internet was connected at UCLA. Um, I think it's not going to happen. So there's going to be pressure to fix the internet. And that's not going to be the band-aids that I mentioned of all sorts of additions around the edges. It's going to be an architectural change. Now, that architectural change is going to have to do something in the area, the one el element that makes the single point characteristics of the internet possible, and that's the IP numbering system and IP addresses. Because it's the fact that everybody on the, in the world can get an IP number, which means they can be directly addressed by anyone else. Hello, sir, I see you, means that um, we have to do some kind of architectural change with the internet. And I want to go on a segue for just a second before I hit the punchline. And that's uh, amazing enough, Roger Fraumann, who's here, and I think one of the organizers, perhaps, of this event, um, uh, was in Australia when I was giving a keynote at the Australian Unix user group in 1993, just before the internet was discovered by Al Gore and other people. And, and um, 
Uh, Roger gave a talk on the side of the conference about the US government military 2025 study, which tried to ask the question, where are we going to be in 25 years? How are we going to do warfare? How should we think about it? And how should we prepare for it in terms of ordinance and doctrine and policy? And Roger did a brilliant job of, of abstracting the con conclusions of the 2025 report so perfectly that I thought he was completely nuts. Um, <laughs> and he said that the only important conclusion and the central conclusion, the essence of the report was, if you can identify something, that means if you can locate it, you can make it go away. That is our level of exposure on the internet. We all have IP numbers. We'll put a lot of Band-Aids on, we'll be safer in certain ways, but we may not be safe in particular ways. And maybe the ways that count the most. So there will be great pressure to change the architecture. But that takes us to, again, the central value and approach of this group, which is that we are certainly on the horns of a dilemma. Um, everyone uses dilemma in the modern era as pointing to two choices, both of which are pretty hideous. But in fact, a more historical view of the term dilemma is that, when the, is that the very thing that you love is the thing that kills you. And Midas is the perfect example, right? It invokes golden geese and eggs and such. But Midas wants gold. Or any form of marriage. Uh, ab absolutely. <laughs> I, I use that sound. I, I take that as a given. I did not think an explicit reference was necessary. <laughs> So Midas wants everything to turn to gold, and he, the hamburger meets his lips, and he starves to death. And that's the dilemma of this group. If we're going to fix the internet, and maybe even make architectural changes in a broad base, and there's a lot of interest in this around the world, possibly led by the Chinese, if we're going to change it, how do we not fall in, not just on the horns of a dilemma, but in a pit where by fixing the internet and changing the architecture to keep people from being right this close to each other, which I think is the right of humanity, that's a slightly Adam Smith concept, if we change that characteristic of the internet, we may kill it. And we may kill the one thing that's going to advance us forward and allow us to actually survive the most wonderful disruptive change of our lifetime. That's the challenge of this group. That's our dilemma. Change the internet, but don't make it go away. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, we'll take some questions in, uh, in, in a second, if that's OK. okay. Uh, so, so, so write it down and hold the thought. But we, we, I think that was you know, a very, very interesting perspective there from Glenn. And, and I'm, I've already got a couple of questions I think we'll come back to. I think one of the most, the, the key points that, um, that, that, that Glenn made right there right at the end was, was a very interesting one. It's uh, been reflected by Major General Shaw, who some of you may have heard of, uh, who is a British Army commander. He actually said that the challenge that we all face is how to live in a digital age. And I think that's, that's really where we're at. And I think that's what we're discussing, is that we're in a, we're in a new era. Uh, <coughs> my own. My own kind of background and perspective uh, to, to give you a, you know, a bit update on that, uh, that very overblown bio that Darren's already read of me uh, was that, uh, you know, when, when Darren said I, I founded an organization called AV, and that, that, that's true, but that sounds a lot grander than it actually is. What it was was a, was a barroom discussion, as often these things are, with a, with a bunch of people who were saying, how do we get information quickly? How do we share information more, 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 more uh, effectively between the people who can do something about this stuff uh, and, um, uh, and make things safer for all of us? So we're talking about people who are in you know, large corporations, people who are in governments, people who are in uh, three-letter organizations, all of us trying to collaborate to share information uh, very, very rapidly about emerging malware threats. And that was, the, that was really the, the very core of what, what we were trying to do. So we built this enormous grassroots operation that simply allowed us, when one of us saw a threat, to report that threat. And uh, the power of the network really was that you didn't any longer need to rely on a, a given vendor who, who, you know, who could consider as the priesthood of the antivirus world. If they, you know, if, they do, if they wanted to give you information, you could get it. Otherwise, it was completely incomprehensible to anyone else. Uh, what, what, what was actually going on, to a point where we were actually the first people to see the threats and we started to turn the tables where we were being able to share the information with the vendors who could then update us and make us safer. And the, you know, one of the real power um, moments of that network really came on September 11, 2001. And I don't need to go into the details of uh, what happened on that day, obviously, but they, the, 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 the network was an incredible point of contact for people. And I think it was the point at which we realized that there was a real convergence of technology not just being used for a single purpose, but for the only purpose which, uh, under which mankind exists, and that is communication. We are communicative beings. We live in communication with each other, 
with our groups, with wider groups. And the interesting thing about the, the um, I think Glenn's point about you know, language and people uh, not, you know, not necessarily getting on, I think is amply proved by anyone who's ever been on any news group or forum or <laughs> even Facebook or whatever. You, you know, the, the moment that people oh, yeah. start discussing any given topic, it brings out the worst in people, and there's a wonderful law called Godwin's Law, which, which, which essentially means that the moment you start calling someone Hitler or a fascist, you've really lost the game. So, that's, uh, you know, but that usually happens within about six replies on any given, <laughs> <laughs> on any given thing. So, uh, but a little bit about, you know, a little bit about malware is, you know, is, is very interesting because malware. I think there are two technologies that have driven the internet, and I, I, probably slightly controversially in this, but you know, perhaps Glenn will uh, wildly disagree with me. The first, <laughs> the first technology that, that really, or the first driver of the internet was pornography. I don't think you know, that that's an incredibly controversial uh, statement, but it really was. I mean, the, 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 the people's ability to access pornography, and uh, interestingly enough, also created the antivirus industry, because what happened was, there's a guy called John McAfee, <coughs> who some of you may have heard of, was running bulletin boards back in, the, uh, back in the day when bulletin boards were still a thing. And those bulletin boards contained you know, lots and lots of information about um, all kinds of adult activities and images and uh, where to meet up for parties and all those kind of things. And that. Uh, also gave an opportunity for people to start uploading these files and sharing them with each other. And one of the interesting things was that, uh, for whatever reason, some people thought it was a good idea to try and start uploading these things called viruses to bulletin boards, and people started getting infected with those things uh, across the nascent internet. And John McAfee saw an opportunity in this and decided to hire a bunch of people and write some detection software. Now, I'm not saying that that was the, the, the founding of the antivirus thing, but it was certainly a, it was certainly a driver of popular, popularizing the need and linking the need to have security on your computer when you're doing anything on the computer. And uh, that anything for very, very many people, uh, male and female, was and using remains. <laughs> and remains to this day uh, looking at um, pornographic images. The other significant driver, I think, of, of the internet has, has almost um, very little to do with the technology itself. I think the actual driver for the internet has been crime. I, I don't think it's... I thought it's... you were going to say gaming. That's really what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> well, game, you know, gaming, is, gaming is kind of a, a subculture within, within that. We can probably... I'm sure you have some interesting thoughts on that, so we'll come back to that thought. But I think that, that actually crime and, and, and criminality has been a big driver because one of the ways that, um, one of the ways that criminals uh, don't survive for very long is, and end up in front of people uh, like Judge Demon here is that they get caught. They do things that expose them and then they get caught. But if you can get to a situation where you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of criminals all doing the same things, the chances that one individual will get caught statistically goes down. And if you have a slightly limited uh, workforce of individuals who can, first of all, have jurisdiction over you, and secondly, get anywhere near you and find out who you are, uh, then the chances again go up. So if you're operating in a cross-border environment, you can operate pretty much with impunity anywhere in the world and be fairly sure that you'll get away with it for at least uh, a reasonable amount of time. And one of the things that I think we've seen as we've seen malware progress from the early days where it was kind of hobbyists and people wanting to get their name in lights and get something on the wild list. And you still heard of the wild list? Who's heard of the wild list here? Okay, very, very few people. So the wild list was a very important thing in the early days. It told you what viruses were out there. And that in itself tells you something interesting about how things have grown. It's like, you could write a list of these things. <laughs> That's how many there were. There were so few that you could write lists about them. But now, you know, this game has changed. But what actually started to happen was we got to a situation where, well, first of all, the internet was expensive. It was expensive to use the internet. So people developed these things called AOL password stealers. And who remembers AOL? <laughs> 
so when you had, you know, back in the day when you had AOL or CompuServe, you know, which was pretty much the only way you could get on the internet as a, as a, com as a non-commercial entity, you had a, you know, dial up and you got on the internet and, uh, you know, the chances were you could download something from one of those nice adult sites and then it would be a Trojan dialer, which was something that would reconnect your modem. Who remembers modems? <laughs> 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 To, the, to, a, a, to a premium rate number and charge you huge amounts of money or would steal your password for AOL so someone else could use your AOL or your CompuServe or whatever. So those, those were the kind of the early criminal you know, activities on the internet which was really about getting hold of something that was valuable. And then what happened was we started to progress so we started to see worms, we started to see things spreading via email and some of those things were kind of, again, hobbyist motivated, some of them were politically motivated, and once again, some of them were criminally motivated to start stealing interesting things like harvesting your address book so that they could send spam to them, and spam became a big phenomenon. So once that kind of wave went away, what we started to see then was this clever and innovative idea called spyware. And that was really about really being able to target advertising, target... Uh, all kinds of uh, interesting stuff and finding out behaviors of people, finding out what they were doing, where they were visiting, where they were going, who they were seeing, what they were saying, getting their credit card details to a certain extent. Um, but those early days were really about, a lot of them were about delivering clicks to advertising and there were the very, very big companies who were quietly letting this going on. And again, things happened, victims got together, they formed, uh, formed working groups, they formed groups that put pressure on governments and those people started to go away. But all the way along, the activity has been driven and the waves of malware have been driven by new types of criminal activity until we're in the situation where we are now, where the biggest amount of stuff that we see on a daily basis, and we see somewhere around two to 300,000 new pieces of malware every day, the biggest driver for all of that stuff being out there is criminals trying to steal your credit card, your financial information, your, you know, your identity to some extent, your uh, information about you know, your, your habits online and all that kind of things. We've got you know, one, the, the more legitimized side of it is you know, extremely explicit tracking um, right down to people who are really just trying to get hold of your, your, your bank account and, and clean it out. So I actually would argue that the, the, the technology and, and the security side of it has almost been driven in this cat and mouse uh, arms race between security and criminality. And that's really what is, I think, if you look at the traffic patterns on the internet, there's a huge, huge, huge percentage of traffic which is only to do with criminal activity, with botnets, with spam, with uh, DDoS attacks and all that. And all this traffic is out there being generated. If you took away, completely wholesale, took away the, 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 the criminal traffic, there would be not that much left. There would be a few people looking at pornography. So that's my kind of uh, <laughs> lead into it. So consider this for a moment that here we are, and we, we talked about one of our overarching philosophies, is protecting the ability of people to exchange information. That is how we view uh, the value, the philosophical value of the internet. Put aside everything else it does for commerce, but at its heart, it, it, it's designed to allow people to communicate in a virtually real-time basis to be able to, to breach some of these barriers, uh, assuming that we have a common language. That is a ridiculously Western perspective. This very same group, if we were all sitting somewhere in the Far East, might be saying, what we need to do is manage the information that our citizens are allowed to see. And they would be just as vehement about the importance of that to their way of life as we are to open information being you know, our reason to be. And who's to say which version is right? You know, what, and who's to say whose version of reality is going to succeed in the end? I have an answer. Good, let's hear it. <laughs> Mr. Might makes right. <laughs> that's it. I'm sorry, that's it. It's throw weight. That's what decides. Well, and that's kind of scary if you think about, you know, who is the next big power uh, economically, politically, uh, just in terms of sheer mass. Uh, 
China has a very, very different view of its citizens' rights uh, than we in the Western world do. And that collision is, uh, is, is scary uh, for a host of reasons. On the business side, it's scary. What we consider malware, they consider legitimate tools of protecting mm -hmm. their national security. Yep. Uh, I mean, what London we consider is, crime, they consider patriotism. Right. I think there's a, you know, there are certainly challenges there. And, you know, there is, there is a, also an aspect that I think once you've commoditized something, you take it for granted. And I think in this country, particularly or in the West, generally, the internet is a commodity. It's just taken for granted. It's just a thing that's there. And I think the, the, the problem is, is that there are, I don't think in that sense, the internet is any one thing because it's pretty much what we all take it for. We buy the internet for different things. You know, I, I buy it so that I can, you know, look at pictures of cats and, and you know, deliver antivirus software to the world and, you know. Nude uh, cats? Nude cats, mostly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, that's a great and, synonym, and, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, then, then there are other people who are, who are using it for, for, for other tools. So, you know, the reason that you buy the internet might be if you, you know, granny in uh, Alabama, let's pick on Alabama for today. And uh, Alabama, which is, which China. It's a good, French. yeah, it's a good thing French. to do. French, you know? yeah, we're, we're bashing everyone. <laughs> we'll bash everyone equally. Uh, you know, once you, that person is using the internet for entirely different things. They want, to, they want to communicate with their grandchildren and we use Skype or whatever. But then on the other side of that, you know, you've got other people who I want to use it for criminal behavior. I want to use it for, uh, you know, finding out, uh, you know, how networks work. I want to find, I want to work out how I can control it as a government. So I think there are all those different aspects. And I think the danger that we have here is that because it's commoditized and because it's open and because it's free and because we feel like we're completely almost anonymous, you know, hey guys, I'm, I'm, I'm Jim Feinstein, I'm from Germany. You don't know that on the internet, you know, you know it now that I'm sitting here and, and, I, and you've already been told that I'm, I'm Andrew Lee from ESET, but on the internet, I can be anyone I want. So I want to roll out and uh, extend on, on that and some comments that the judge made to reinforce his point. It's a common place in my side of the industry, we like to say the Bill of Rights is a local ordinance. And <laughs> for people who haven't heard that before, it's kind of cute and a little bit funny, but boy, it it's as serious as a heart attack, because 30 miles south of here, it doesn't apply, right? And if you go north, up into Canada, they have a very different idea of rights. They have group rights, and they think a melting pot is actually despotic. So to emphasize the judge's point, it's not just China, and I'd recommend against just thinking about it that way, that they have a different system. The vast majority of the world is not based on a British common law universal rights of man model. It may be in the, in the UN Charter, but it's not in the hearts and minds of most cultures, and it's not in the hearts and minds of most governments. They're doing it largely because it's been the system that has worked. And as the United States and Western Europe continue to flutter around and fail in providing economic and, if you will, social leadership, the rise of managed economies and managed trade and more managed people, which means how could we let foolish people say whatever they want in public? Which yeah. is what most people think most of the time in most countries. Even most Americans don't buy into the American model. I think that's a, a, a truth. I uh, just want to make one more sort of kind of point. I think if it's always, it's always, always, always a good thing to look at history. I'm not saying we should completely rely on history as a, as a, as a true indicator of the future, but if, but you certainly, it's certainly true that if you, you know, if you forget the past, then you are really doomed to repeat it. And if you get to a point where you forget how history used to be, it's not that long since we didn't have these fundamental rights of free speech. You know, this country isn't that old, it's older than most of us. Well, a few of us, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so look, look at something. Most people forget the United States is the, is the longest standing single governmental form constitutional democracy on earth. Right. No one's even close, right? Which right. brings you to Germany. Germany never had a democratic revolution. I mean, Germany looks democratic, free, and liberal in both European senses, right? But how thick is that? It's a generation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you look at, you know, if you look at the power of the government before. If you, if you want to talk about global government, all you need to do is look back a few hundred years and look at the power of the Roman church. And, you know, the 14th century, anyone who thinks that this century is bad, you want to read about the 14th century and what was going on there with, you know, with, with widespread bubonic plague, with inquisitions, with complete lack of freedom, serfdom, really, of, of the peoples. But of, you only lived Europe, to about so. 28 years ago. Yeah, you, you didn't care. You didn't have to suffer that long. <laughs> 
So, you know, so I think it's very important to, to remember in perspective that the freedoms that we think that we have here are very, very limited and they are very, very enclosed to, to us as a community. And as we, as we face kind of the global challenge of, of a global internet and people with different perspectives, I think it's going to change how we view that a lot. And one of the very interesting things as I you know, kind of monitor the, the whole kind of Arab Spring phenomenon is the way that free speech is limited by up and to a point where you can talk about democracy and you can talk about government, but you simply cannot talk about religion. And anything that sways into the realm of criticism of the religious structure is, 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 is not just uh, taboo, but absolutely, um, out, it, people just don't even think about mentioning that kind of stuff. And, and that's why it's so shocking to them. And I think this is an important point to understand. It's so shocking to them is that anyone could even consider making that kind of an insult against uh, a religious institution because it's simply not part of the culture. So I think that's, those are important points. I think there's a good time to open up to some questions. So I'm going to go back to John here in the front. Yeah, I uh, was very fortunate in the sense that I got to do a lot of SEC work in northern China, which is kind of an odd place to do SEC work. And I think there's an interesting perspective of China, which is this continued ascendancy, you know, that it's going to continue to grow. But I'd like to get your perspective on what happens if the opposite takes place. And if we think about the type of crime and some of the issues that are taking place in what was the former Soviet Union, how do we think about a scenario where maybe China starts to implode, implode where they can't maintain social stability, given the vast you know, demographic challenges that they have, and, and how we think about those types of scenarios, where it's not state-sponsored, but more individual or, or group-oriented? Uh, I think it's an excellent point. Um, if, you, if you talk to the Chinese, if you, talk to, if you visit China, you talk to Chinese government officials, they think that they're on a, on a unicycle on the edge of a cliff, and it's going up at an incline of 9%, and they're being chased by a mob. <laughs> and the cliff's straight down. And they're right. Yeah, and they're motivated. I mean, they're motivated by a lot of things. Well, um, you know, Neil Ferguson, also yeah. the, the economic historian, yeah, puts... Him, by the way. Yeah. yeah, he's pretty cool. Um, uh, and, you know, he makes the point that, you know, advanced societies are dynamically unstable. And the United States is equally so, and our institutions are changing fast. And, you know, how will we endure that? So there's a lot of instability there. I would say that if, if China fails to grow as the juggernaut that it has, if it goes from 9% to 6%, there are going to be even more social dislocations. It's done a little bit, a little bit of that already. But if it goes down to 3 or 4%, um, the government could see enormous challenges, more than what, the 10,000 or 50,000 demonstrations every year, some insane number. Um, and when it goes down, it's going to be amazingly disruptive for the rest of the world. They're integrated into the world system. There are now our production lines. You saw the crazy supply chain impacts that happened because of the tsunami in Japan. And uh, the best thing for the world is for China to continue to develop in both senses, economically develop and join the rest of the world in some new emerging global culture. You know, the, it's going to be tough. The former Soviet bloc is kind of an inter mm -hmm. interesting analogy in a way. They had a system in which anybody can get as much education as they could uh, paid for by the state. So you ended up with a large number of PhD level engineers who after the collapse of the system had no source of income um, and turned to any way they could mm -hmm. to generate income. And you also had uh, governments that were governments in name only and driven almost entirely by corruption. Um, so that model of lawlessness, which do does have an impact upon us, uh, because that's, this is where the money is still. What was it? Willie, Willie, uh, the Willie, Willie Willie Sutton. Willie Willie Sutton, 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 the bank robber, number Our 11 man. on the FBI's most wanted list <laughs> when he was first put on. Mike, I have an uncle who was number 16, so I, <laughs> I, I this, is, this is true. The heritage up front this, here is amazing. This, this, is, this is true. Um, I don't know that if China ceases to maintain its level of development, it would devolve into the same model that we saw in the former Soviet republics. So I don't know that the analogy yeah. An important, works. important element of that is that as, as nasty as Russian business can be, and, and their oligarchy and their, their criminal element and their government are just really one piece of fabric, welcome to early capitalist countries, yeah. right? And if we look back in the United States at uh, you know, 220 Absolutely. years ago, it yeah. was a rough place. It's a rough place now, but it was um, astonishingly rough by comparison. And to some extent with China. So big changes? I think you know, the, 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 the thing for me that's always interesting is you, you can look at a nation state as, as, as kind of a 
a separate entity from other nation states, but you can't look at the internet in that way. So if, 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 if one nation state kind of breaks, it doesn't necessarily have that big an impact on, on what happens to the rest of it. And I, I think that ones that we probably want to, to look at, you know, you can, you can think of all the stands and all of that as, as being, you know, places where we, we worry about, but I think if you look at places like Somalia, you know, which hasn't had an effective government for 20, 20 something years, and yet it has very little inf infrastructure even to have an effect on the internet, let alone, you know, so, but we still worry that, you know, a lone wolf actor will come and, and, and do something, you know, there. And I think the big worry is, you know, with, with China is what will it do to the cost of, of things like, you know, data centers, so for instance, you know, it, I mean, there was a huge flood in Thailand and it, it caused a big squeeze on the availability of hard drives last year. And, you know, so what happens then? Well, suddenly the cost of storing our data goes up. So cost of goods, cost of being able to do business may go up, but the actual infrastructure of the, of the internet is pretty, is pretty uh, resistant to that kind of, to any kind of damage. And I think the attacks, the, the sort of attacks that we saw on Estonia, that we've seen on um, Georgia, not, not the state here, but in, you know, the former Soviet bloc, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, you know, those, those you kind your, of... Your formal penal colony, our state of Georgia? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> uh, those, you know, those, those, those attacks... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, Anyone you can, can say that kind of stuff. So, uh, <laughs> those, those attacks, you know, they had a lot of, they had a measurable impact, but actually what the interesting thing is, if you look at Estonia now, it's probably one of the most resilient countries in the world in terms of its ability to withstand DDoS attacks from mm -hmm from other nation states. So, you know, the, I think there's a sense in which we probably need to look at the problem the other way around and see, well, what's our vulnerability? You know, what's our vulnerability to a nation state attacking us? Well, frankly, we're the most economically connected country in the world. We have most of our economy reliant on internet technologies, the way that we do banking, the way that we do commerce, the way that we do communication is all reliant on this stuff. So it probably behooves us to take a good look at how we're securing our own networks, our own personal infrastructure, our business infrastructure, our government infrastructure, you know, and, and actually look at ways of, first of all, and I think this is a very, very important factor, first of all, reducing the cost. And we're in this wonderful facility here that is all about reducing the cost of, of, of energy needs. That reduces our reliance on fossil fuels. It reduces our reliance on you know, manufactured goods. Uh, and that, in turn, has a knock-on effect throughout business. It reduces the cost of things to us. Uh, therefore, we don't have as much need to you know, go to China and buy stuff. We can afford to manufacture it here at a slightly higher cost, So, or, the, or in Tijuana or where, wherever it is. So, it, the global economy is a global economy for a reason. It, 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 it really, you know, if you, if you look at a pure capitalist system, it kind of roots around the damage and goes to wherever it's cheapest and, and most able to, to survive. So uh, Something in, in the area which I think I'd like this group to, to be aware of, in case you're not, um, is, is that there's a heel over that's about to happen in global, global manufacturing. There's a big revolution going on. China's value in the world as a, as a, as a factory floor has been cheap hands highly controllable, trainable, cheap hands, and they're really good at it, very motivated. But with the increases in large-scale integration, greater automation, CAD, CAM, and so on, while China is trying to march as quickly as it can up the value added manufacturing, and by the way, they're losing millions of jobs in manufacturing. I think they lost 15 million jobs in the last 15 years in manufacturing because they're automating. Then at the same time in that equation um, is adoption of greater automated factory and manufacturing methods in the United States and Western Europe and at the point of consumption. And it may be that China's great historical leverage is disappearing faster than any of us think. We'll see. It's, and 3D printing is coming on board. There's lots of dimensions. Roger, you had a question. Uh, we're at a, an, an inter interesting juncture in time. I, the PC is going away. It's getting replaced by intelligent devices of all kinds. Uh, you know, whether it's the mobile phone base, those kinds of things. The, the networks that serve, quote unquote, the internet dial tone to those devices actually pass through different hands, typically. Uh, you're starting to have different vendors actually come back into play that were kind of pushed to the periphery, like telecommunications companies, right? And so the, the, the essence of my question is, is that historically there's been bodies of law, like in telecommunications, in protecting you know, the AT&T suit in the 50s that protected AT&T from uh, somebody libeling somebody else and you couldn't sue the, the phone company. 
uh, so the carrier became exempted. Or the post office, with postal law and first class mail, you can seal the envelope, only inspectors at the country of origination. Under, under the law that's called simple carrier, right. Yep, yep. So, so there's, there's bodies of law, concepts of law <laughs> that apply to telecommunications, to postal, which in a, you know, the Deutsche Post tried to have applied to email and failed. Um, and, and we could go on, you know, copyright law, trademark law, patent law, in, uh, the various intellectual properties. So where things are going now is a convergence where it's becoming a soup that I can get an internet dial tone coming over personal devices from a variety of different competing resources in different countries, whether it used to be dominated by the postal system in one country or dominated by uh, a telephone in another, et cetera. And so you end up with commercial interests that have commercial uh, interests in mind because you know, over half of the information arguably on the internet today is just garbage. You know, it's criminal, it's porn, it's whatever, right? So you end up with a lot of these commercial carriers or spam, right? So you end up with tremendous amounts of spam, and so the commercial carriers are starting to look at it and say, you know something? This is a cost of business we don't have to bear anymore, shouldn't have to bear, we want to impose. So I think that, that a change that's coming, right, at us is one, the change in the way it's going to be delivered, but the second is the commercial concerns and how they're going to enforce commercial laws so to speak, and I was just interested in your perspective. I think there's, in, you know, if I can just jump in with this, it's something I thought, you know, thought a lot about, you know, because it, every time I see, every time I see, you know, a company, and I'm, let's leave the government out of this for a moment, they get enough beating as it is, but every time I see a company try to do something which looks restrictive to their customers, they just lose their customers. And I, I think that's, you know, the, the real key to it is, is that the consumer drives the market and it's not the other way around. So if you, if you end up with, a, you know, a Verizon or an AT&T and, and all those big guys who are imposing lots and lots of limits on their customers, the customers will go to the guy with, with lower limits and eventually someone will start up and go, it would be a really cool idea if I give you unlimited bandwidth. So I'm going to create a company that gives you unlimited bandwidth and then everyone jumps to you and, you know, if you can sustain the business model, if you can make it cheap enough for you to run that business. So I, you know, I, I, I kind of take the point, but you know, the communications companies have always, the telecoms companies have always run the, run the internet in that sense. They've always carried the tone, they've carried the signal, uh, the satellite, you know, whether it's hardwire, whether it's tele, you know, whether it's cellular or whatever it is. There, that's still. Two, there's two points there, though. One <coughs> is what's happening with with uh, Android apps versus iPhone apps, and the the right. So that's that's a whole thing of self preservation for the for the benefit of the customer, but the companies are going to have to do that. And the second is going to be the point of taxation, that the telephone industry spent a, a hundred years developing tariff uh, restrictions and zones and how to tax, and so your local government can tax a telephone all the way through, and it's not been applied yet elegantly to the internet traffic, but it's coming, right? And the and the commercial interests are going to have to be the tax collector. So and, and it's going to affect us. There's a, there's a kind of fun way that you can start looking at the internet. So, uh, and kids are doing this, and I think adults are doing it a little bit. Um, we live in two worlds now. We live in meat space, where it's dominated by three, meat space. We have three-dimensional um, space, you know, uh, inverse square law here. Some and of us have more meat than sec. others. <laughs> <laughs> Abs kidneys, we're talking kidneys. Um, and, um, uh, and then there's, then there's the internet, where everybody in the world meets. And when you step off the internet, it's, it's, it's becoming quite a transitional experience. My avatar is much better looking than this. <laughs> he's young, no, he's fit. No, we all Man. disagree. <laughs> so, Do you um, like Paul Ryan? <laughs> so we, we, we live in two planes. They're merging a little bit with mobile, right? But we live in, the, in these two planes. And what, what that means is when we're all living there most of the time, that's the place where the taxes are going to have to happen. Will they be monolithic and clean and simple and understandable? Will they be related to costs? Or will they just be harvesting at points of ease of government uh, getting taxes? It's almost certainly going to be the latter. It's going to be messy. That's what governments do. They're not interested in efficiency. We talked um, with some of the ISPs in the earlier times um, locally about whether or not we can enlist our local ISPs 
in helping to notify their customers that their computers were insecure. Because they knew it, obviously. And the answer was a resounding no, that their job is to carry traffic. And until, unless and until it affects their ability to carry right. traffic, they are not interested ultimately in what their consumer does in terms of securing their own systems. So, you know, what you're suggesting is likely to happen when the ISPs, when the carriers say that it's affecting, as, as it is now, as their bandwidth is narrowing due to the volume of illegitimate, if you will, traffic that occurs on it. Well, that's a good point. Um, so once that issue becomes one of business significance, that's when you'll see the paradigm change you're talking about, I think. And to defend a little bit the, the role of the ISPs, and maybe they've been foolish in that, the, the business models of policing end systems and delivering content are excruciatingly different. It's not just, oh, point this little tool at it and we'll find out stuff. They're completely different businesses and that's probably why your business exists. So, but that said, the ISPs may be much smarter to develop alliances, make acquisitions, and so on and so forth. However, I want to add one more point. Uh, to give an example of how hard it is to do what you're saying, which is very sensible, I was involved in a lot of the committee meetings looking at the construction of IPv4 and uh, all the other related issues. I'm sorry, the, the, the development of IPv6 over v, v4. There's literally no way to get the end users to do anything yeah. in any sensible way. It's not possible. I mean, it's not just difficult, it's not possible. The idea of a flag day one day when we cut over the whole world can't happen. Everything's got to happen by steady and small accretion. And that's the opening for what you're talking and, and about. You know, when I worked at Microsoft for a year and a half, during, during the time where, where the operating system was defaulted open and users had to take steps to close it down, it was a huge battle within the company to start delivering the operating system locked down and have the user open it. Think about um, access points, routers, wireless access points people get. Typically, they are out of the box, defaulted, open, broadcasting, no security. Still, they're that. Uh, actually, it's not true. I just bought a new wireless end router, and it was defaulted to using encryption, which amazed me. So, well, but it's true. But we're starting, we're starting to see what you're talking about, which is the manufacturers, or the, mm. I mean, it's not the carriers, the manufacturers are starting to take some responsibility. Well, it's driven by, I think it's been driven by, the thing is it's been driven by customer awareness and customer demand. You know, this is a, you know, everything that makes America great is also everything that makes America bad. You know, Wonky, we, are a, we are a capitalist society and businesses only do pretty much what their customers want or what they think they can get away with their customers wanting. So, uh, you know, that's, the, that's the reality. But, we but try, you know, we, I think that the, Having said that, you know, as, 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 as someone who runs a business, <laughs> I think you know, there, are, there are commercial realities that you have to adhere to, but you do genuinely want to try and serve the customer good. So if you become aware of something that will help, I think you try to do it. Well, in, if you're in Apple, a, just in tell the customer what they want. Yeah, yeah. well, that's it. Yeah. But, but don't, don't, in, don't, don't under us to underestimate the, the complexity and the, and the competitive pressures of just delivering packets. I mean, that is so hard to get it right all the time, 24 hours a day, 9,000 days a year, you know, just yeah. the whole thing. And, and if you get off that just a little bit and you start failing to deliver packets, either because you're, you're diverted in your attention or because you're, you're serving some other master, you're going to get eaten by your competition. So it requires yeah. the kind of evolution I think one of you said where at some point it's impacting your business. So the competitive pressure is... I, I yeah, said that. This guy. Um, so it's, it, the pressures are so great, they have no choice. And maybe we're there and that would be a good thing. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. Oh, we've got about a minute. Well, you, you've got a hard stop at 9.30. I have a hard so stop at 9.30. Yeah. Taking my responsibility seriously. And we're gonna it was, it was an order. <laughs> but we can make the so, circle and say come by. So I'm sure, that, uh, I'm sure there'll be other opportunities throughout the day to, 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 to meet and discuss. Uh, thank you very much for all the input and for the question. Thank you to the panel. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.